Let me introduce Michelle once again. Michelle is the chair of the FRC board. She's dean of Regents, Regent School of Government. And she, uh, among other things, uh, she is a prayer warrior. She's also the co-chair of the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast. And she has taken on this issue of global governance. She has gone many times to Geneva just to be on-site pray. Gabe Lyons, to my far left down there at the end, he is the founder and president of Think Media and hosts the Undercurrent podcast, which equips Christians to grow in cultural discernment. And, and Gabe has been prophetically addressing the current global issues and helping Christians navigate this in this increasingly hostile <laughs> culture uh, here in the West. So, Gabe, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. And Travis Weber serves as Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs here at the Family Research Council and, and is currently spearheading our international work. Travis is a Navy pilot, a graduate of the Naval Academy. He's uh, also a lawyer by training, uh, having attended Regent University School of Law and Georgetown Law. He focused on international law and human rights. He uh, was actually at the meeting of the World Health Assembly in Geneva, um, Switzerland, in May of this last year, where the WHO was considering this pandemic agreement and other issues. So we're going to have a discussion about the WHO, but the broader issue of what is happening in this push for global governance. So I'm going to start, Michelle, with you. Um, you have really led the way on these issues, and you've been addressing them for some time, even back when you were in Congress. And many are talking about these issues now because of the exposure that you gave to them. At one point, people thought, you're, well, you're just kind of... You're, 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 wear, you're wearing a tin hat. <laughs> uh, this stuff isn't going to happen. Why should Christians be paying attention to what is happening at the WHO and the United Nations and these other global entities? Well, Tony, thank you. The reason why we need to pay attention is because this will impact literally every person on earth. There is no one who won't be impacted by a move toward global governance. As everyone knows, our Constitution guarantees to every American citizen a Republican form of government. That isn't the Republican Party. That's a representative form of government. And what we're talking about with the World Health Organization, what just recently happened in the last two weeks at the United Nations with Pact for the Future, that is establishing a perch for global governance. What I saw with the World Health Organization early on is they were codifying or attempting to codify creating a perch, a place for global governance to emerge. This is something that has been a, a fever dream of the United Nations since 1945 when they were created. They just wanted to be a global government. But it's something that most people have poo-pooed and said it'll never happen. Now they're really serious about it. And I saw it coming to effect. And as a believer, I know what the Bible says about the end times. And in the end times, there will be a global government. And we're seeing a convergence of events prophetically of things that the prophets from thousands of years talked about would actually come about. We're seeing a lot of these events now come into play, and one of them being the emergence of global governance. And of course, about two weeks ago at the UN, rather than the World Health Organization being the one to create that perch, now it's moved into the United Nations with Pact for the Future. They passed a 56-page document, and on page 54, they give the power, augmented power, to the Secretary General of the United Nations so that he has the power to declare a complex global crisis. Which could be any A shock. Yeah. And, and it could include conflicts. Mm -hmm. So that's what they wanted to do with the Secretary of the World Health Organization. And so I saw that in one beat, they went from World Health Organization now they're moving over to the actual United Nations, and they just did this, not by a vote. There was no vote. It was a pre-agreed, consensus-driven document, and at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning, they dropped this document. They just brought a gavel down, and all nations agreed to it. So it wasn't a vote. It was just the gavel came down, and they all said, yep, we all agreed to it, including the United States of America. So there is no country that disagreed with it, and now the Secretary General has these augmented powers to declare, to declare a global complex shock. 
exactly what they were envisioning under the, on the World Health Organization, where he would have had power to, to declare a public health emergency of right. international concern. It doesn't matter what the name is. The, the impact of the power is the same. It is one global leader who will have the power to make a de declaration that triggers other powers that could mean restrictions on the right to travel, that could meet mandates for uh, biologically based uh, digital IDs, that could mean the basis for the next generations. Three PACs were passed that day, but they're very serious about global governance. So all these meetings in Davos, Switzerland, that the World Economic Forum has had, where it's all the billionaires, but not just the billionaires, it's leaders of militaries, leaders of international governments. They've been getting together, and we could ignore them for a long time, but things that they were talking about and envisioning at Davos, strangely, we started to see actually put into place in the United States and in other nations. So they've been serious about this idea of global governance for a long time, and what that means for us is it's restrictions on liberties for us, restrictions on our rights, and what we lose is national sovereignty as a right. nation, but we lose the right to this guarantee of a Republican form of government that we get to choose the leaders that we live under and the issues that we want to govern, be governed by because it's supplanted by a global governance. And it's, it's, we shouldn't think that as we read the book of Revelation that all of a sudden a light switch is going to be flipped and we have global governance. There's going to be a ramp up to it. So it would be natural that we would begin to see these things happening. Hey, Gabe, I want to go to you. I really want to know, as I've watched, you've been speaking to this at great length and depth. Why is this an issue of interest to you? Well, I think as we've been watching this play out over the last decade, really, and you start to see the way that global governance is designed to essentially use words like cooperation to mean control. So, and it's always propaganda, it's always using health scares, it's using some sort of emergency that they can declare so that you have fear, so that you then fall into a psychological, essentially totalitarian mindset to want to obey the orders, and so some leader will tell you what to do, so it removes your anxiety. And I see this in the next generation. A lot of our work with Think Media is hitting the younger generations, and we're seeing the anxiety that they have. I mean, there's even something called climate change anxiety that people are diagnosing with the next generation. They don't have hope for the future. They don't know that they have meaning and purpose because they're being told by world leaders, your world's not gonna be here, and I don't know that you're gonna be here when you're age 50 or 60, so why should you care? Why should you have meaning and purpose? So as Christians, I believe it's fundamental that we keep holding high where our true hope is, and of course that's in Jesus Christ. It's in the gospel, and what God cares about for human beings is free will going forward, and when you start to see governments and you see governance starting to try to replace God and tell you what your rights are and where they come from, then we've now moved into a place where we're going to have to resist. And so we're doing as much as we can to really galvanize leaders, educate them, re-educate the younger generations on some basic ideas about freedom versus control, about global versus local, and, and helping them better understand that this global dynamic that you're hearing so much about, while that's at play, and there's going to be a lot, as Michelle outlined, and there's so much to this that's coming down, that we want them to start to build more resilience in their local communities, and we want them to start living out what it means to be free-willed human beings so that we actually don't fall under, essentially, this trance of right. thinking, this is just the way it has to be. It doesn't. Well, you know, I have to say, I do have sometimes climate anxiety. When I get up in the morning, I want to go run, and it's raining. I get a little anxious. So I, I do have a little climate anxiety. Um, but that's another story. <laughs> I, I wanna, I, you said something recently in an interview with John Brevere. You were talking about this, and, and, and you were discussing how Christians need to prepare for this. So this is not something that's just passing. It's something we need to understand here and now. And you, you, you said we need to begin to develop trusted networks. Explain that a little bit of what that looks like. Well, I think people feel hopelessness when you think about this large global UN agreed upon compact that's going to essentially start to put in controls, whether it's digital currency, whether it's digital biometric markers that you start to have to comply with, and you start to, again, feel discouraged. I think it's giving us an opportunity to go back to some real basics about how human beings were designed to flourish and function anyway. And that is in community, 
I think it's more local than it is national or global. Mm -hmm. And I think we're getting invited into a new opportunity. And we're experiencing that in our own area in Tennessee where new relationships have formed because people are recognizing the challenges from the outside are going to keep coming. The supply chain issues that we've experienced and are experiencing, these may not go away. Controls that come in mean that you either start to live under that control or you create a parallel. You build a parallel that people can start to imagine and go, oh, there's a different way of life. I don't have to do that. I know where my food sources are coming from. I'm friends with farmers. I'm building local networks of trust with people in my community where we're going to barter and trade. We don't have to opt into this system. Yeah. And that's not going to be easy. But I think all of us experienced during COVID that this control went so far that there was a moment, and in some states and some cities you were experiencing this, and certainly some countries did, where if you weren't vaccinated, you weren't going to get access mm -hmm. to the hospital. You weren't getting access, and still today some people aren't getting access to transplants because they don't have these vaccinations. So you need to start imagining, and I think our churches need to start imagining, what does a future look like where your people aren't getting access to goods and services that they just assumed would always be there? And what is our role responsibly to start building that parallel, whether it's food, whether it's medical? I think we're already seeing that movement happen in education, which should encourage so many, whether it's homeschooling, Christian schools, that's a parallel. And when we build the parallel, now all of a sudden the other people around us that may not even believe in Jesus, they go, wait, those people seem to be flourishing. They seem to be full of life, meaning, purpose. They kind of know where to go for their goods and services. I want to be a part of that. Right. If we don't create that parallel in time, then people just opt into the system and assume, well, this is just the way life's going. We ought to do it. And we want to do everything we can to prevent that. Travis, I'm coming to you, but I, I, you touched on it, but I want, to, I want you to expound it just a little bit more. What role does the church have in this? Trusted networks? I mean, don't we already have community in the church that can be built out from that? Don't we have a foundation yes. that we can just begin to build rapidly on? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the church, of course, has since the first century, right, has always been these little communities, mostly living under empire rule and always having to figure out creatively, how are we going to survive? How are we going to keep speaking the truth even when it in the future will be labeled disinformation or hate speech? How do we continue to operate? We don't shrink back, but we only can do that when we do have these trusted communities and relationships. And the church can be the center of that. But I find a lot of pastors aren't aware of some of this information. They realize that some people in their congregation are thinking about it. Lots of times men start thinking about this. You, you know of the prepper movement and people starting to prepare and try to get their food supplies in place. This is good wisdom. However, in isolation, it can lead to really bad decision making. And what we have found is when a church community can come around and say, hey, I know some of you are thinking about these things. We're going to create an evening to just talk about this as a church and as a community and have a conversation and get it out in the open and start processing through how has God called this community together to help us be more resilient, to be more self-reliant. I mean, First Thess Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12 talks about living a quiet life and working with your hands so you're not dependent on anyone. Well, in American Civilization Day, we're dependent on everyone. So it would be biblical to get back to a way of life that perhaps our grandfathers and great-grandfathers understood and knew, which was a life that was a lot more fulfilling, but also relied on other people, a network, and didn't put all of our hope in the government or our supply chain to help us flourish. And I'm sure you're talking about more than just more church potluck suppers. That's right. Yeah. That's we're talking about food. We're talking about medical. We're talking about communication. We're talking about getting serious about education, leadership currency. I think these are all the things we're going to have to think about if we move into a digital control grid. And I so appreciate the fact that you're drilling down on this and speaking even to the younger generation about this. Travis, thank you for being patient. I want to come to you now. You were actually, as I mentioned, in Geneva when the World Health Organization was meeting, the, the, the alliance was meeting to work on the pandemic accord. First, just kind of tell us, what was it like to, uh, to be there? Was there anything that just really kind of surprised you? You went as a part of the Washington stand as a journalist, so you were in the room for all of the proceedings. What was it like? I tell you, well, after hearing Gabe, I'm just thinking, I got to go buy my farm, but put that on hold for a, a little bit. Um, the, uh, no, it was a fascinating experience. And Michelle, as you were sharing, I just was reflecting back on it and how... Um, in the room where the delegates appointed to represent their countries in a deliberation, which the nation, UN, the basically, basically the UN member states, the WHO member states, every nation is part of the UN except two, are considering what they will do. So the nations of the world coming together, 
will there be unity or not? And there was incredible unity, but not the kind that you and I would particularly agree with. Uh, you know, it was, it was fascinating how much, how many pledges were made to health, to, you know, doing more to prevent the next pandemic. What else can we do to uh, what the treaty, what the proposed agreement says, pandemic preparation and response? There was virtually no, no mention of free speech, individual freedom, political or individual freedom, human rights, religious freedom. Those were not raised in the room as considerations to be worked through in this deliberation of the nations of the world, coming together to consider a pandemic preparation response. What was being considered and mentioned over and over, almost like a, like a repetitive pledge, without even really deliberation, it was, we will do more to, to advance health, we will do more to keep our country safe, we will do more to prevent the next pandemic. So, Michelle, as you were sharing, I just was thinking how there's a crisis in the world, the enemy has one plan, God has a certain view of it. And what we saw happening, unfortunately, in that room is the enemy's plans being advanced because the things of God were not being considered. It was mindless pledging and laying tribute at the feet of what they were worshiping, which is this God of we will come together without God. And the pact for the future that Michelle mentioned, every, no, on all the, those pages with all sorts of things being discussed, not one mention of God. So again, the pandemic, we saw a crisis and the world say, instead of addressing the concerns we're raising, we're not even going to remain neutral and consider them. We're going to double down. And the Pact for the Future last week in New York at the General Assembly, in, in a world where the nations want to address certain things, they're saying the typical process of deliberation in the UN, um, we're not going to stick with that. We're actually going to double down and hand power over to an unelected official, the Secretary General, and pledge all these programs in this Pact for the Future, pledge our support to them in a way that will deteriorate sovereignty and move sovereignty and decision-making away from individual nations to world power. So again, that's a lot. But as Gabe said, we know the, the Lord has a perspective on it. He's still on the throne. We just have to have, we have, need to observe it and discern what's happening to be able to pray and to prepare, Gabe, as you were sharing. So I'm going to throw this out for, uh, for, for anyone here to, to answer. All three of you can speak into it. You may, some are probably thinking, well, you know, w what's the difference now? I mean, we had the, the League of Nations. We've had the United Nations since uh, you know, the, world, the end of World War II. Um, so what's the big deal? I mean, we've heard all of this global governance stuff we've been seeing. We've been watching the clowns at the UN for years. What's different now? If I could answer, what is different now is we all lived through a global crisis with COVID. The whole world was impacted by COVID, and it was really more impacted by the global structure that was put in place. And the World Health Organization is an advisory-only organization. It's the health care arm of the United Nations. And yet it seemed as though it was the writ of God. Anything that they would put up on their site that they would recommend, whether it was vaccines, whether it was masking, whether it was standing six feet apart, all of a sudden that was considered the writ of God. And so the Biden administration took whatever the World Health Organization put on their website, again, advisory only, and they put that up on the American Centers for Disease Control website. The, the WHO is not a legislative-making body. The Centers for Disease Control is not a legislative-making body. It's not a law-making body. Congress never passed any law regarding COVID. And yet, the whole country in America was under bondage because we were forcing our military to get vaccines, whether they wanted to or not. And because of what the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, had on their website, which was the WHO recommendations, private employers were mandating vaccinations. They were mandating that if you got on a plane or a public conveyance, you had to wear a mask. You had to stand six feet apart. Today, now Dr. Fauci himself has admitted, yeah, I guess the vaccines didn't work. I guess they didn't prevent transmission. Yeah, I guess the mask didn't stop us from getting the virus. I guess the six feet came out of nowhere. Nobody knows. So it was all a scam. It was all an effort to control people. And it's important to realize, I'm not being political when I say this. I'm just being factual. When Donald Trump was president and the pandemic began, 
He got the United States out of the World Health Organization. He defunded the World Health Organization. He saw the global aspirations of the organization, so he defunded it. But he also filed the paperwork with the UN for the United States to exit the World Health Organization. The day Joe Biden entered office as president, he put the United States right back in the World Health Organization, and he gave all the back funding back to them, too, because, again, we're the big dog at the UN. We pay for everything. China gets its way at the UN, but we pay for everything. So where it's at now is that Joe Biden administration were the ones, Tony, who introduced all of these amendments at the World Health Organization. So it was American-led by the Biden-Harris administration to introduce these amendments to empower a perch for global government. This came out of the Harris administration. This is really one of the main things that's at stake in the election this fall. Will we have an administration that was at the forefront of global governance that wanted to establish it? Or will we have at its head, hopefully someone who will want to go back to pulling us out of it? If it was up to me, this is my opinion only, it's not Tony or anybody else's opinion, if it was up to me, I would pull us out of the United Nations on day one, defund it, and then sell that land in Manhattan, and I'd, order, I'd get a demolition company, take down that building, and say, have at it in Geneva, or Salzburg, or Brussels, wherever you want to go, but get out of the United States of America. That's my opinion. You can speak for me on that one. <laughs> Was COVID-19 a test of the global governance system? I mean, is that what that was? Well, I, Tony, I think, I think yes, absolutely. And, and um, you know, I just to reflect on what Michelle was sharing and your question earlier, we see not only this test and a, a whole, we have a, a kind of a test case, right? Exhibit A to examine this playing out under COVID. Tony, we're in a world now in which the forces that humankind has created, Tower of Babel-like, are leading us to an ability to um, create a system with even tighter control, quicker response. You can have fewer people at the levers of the ship manning that ship, controlling where it goes. Social media, technology, we're entering the world of AI, and who, you know, ex I think we can expect that to go ex exponentially develop in the next year or two. But all these forces accelerate the human tendency to want to fix this without God. You know, you look at Israel right now, it's almost like we have micromanaged war by committee of every nation except Israel dictating from the outside over decisions. Individual decisions should be up to Israel. So what is that? It's speaking to the world, all peering over each other's shoulders, saying, I want to manage that for you and I know better and we have the technology to do it. And so I think this does point us to a situation where different than 1945, different than the 50, you know, the, the time the, since the UN has been around, we've had a world system, but we're in a time in which the technology is exponentially increasing and we have a test case under COVID. Yeah, and I think the digital compact that was just put into place really is kind of a crowning achievement for this goal of control because what most of us do is we walk around, we have a phone on us. This is our digital connection to the world. We're starting to get used to using the QR codes for everything, for access to events. You're being trained. You're being trained to start to think in a way that anything you need, you're going to need to scan something to get it. Now, the challenge for all of us is going to be that digital life and digital currency, which is certainly on the docket moving forward, and many tests are already in place, but there's the threat of a currency that soon could be programmed. And what that means is your currency is programmed as such that if it's dictated that you can't spend your money in this particular place, or when you go to the grocery store, you can only buy this many pounds of meat that month because that's your distribution, all of a sudden the money that you think is yours is being controlled by someone else. That's where f the future of digital currency is absolutely designed to go. And this is in their own words. This is not, not hyperbole. You can just listen to them at their meetings describe what the goal is. They want blockchain and they want the ability to track every single thing you're doing so there's no privacy. Ultimately, that leads to control. Now, this can all be discouraging. Here's what I want to encourage you with. This nation is the one nation that can resist this. Right. Now, thankfully, we have 26 governors who have said we will resist this type of global control. 
we have a couple of bills, one in Congress, one in Senate, that are designed to resist this. So there, there is an appetite to resist this in America, but it's going to take people speaking up. It's going to need, need, people need to hear your voice. We need to be talking to our congressmen, our senators, letting them know you're aware of this, you know where this is going, and this does ultimately not lead to freedom for us. The third thing I would say is this country is made up of 3,143 counties. Okay, the county you live in is going to determine more about the future of your life, whether it's your education board, whether it's your county mayor, your city mayor. I know life for us in my county was very different during COVID than life one county over. Your local sheriff is also the person who can resist these type of global orders coming down and ever being implemented. So if you don't know who your local sheriff is, if you haven't personally reached out or started to engage with your sheriff, they're one of the most powerful people in your county. Right. And so we're talking about resistance at the global level, but I want you to see some stop gaps here. The nation has to keep resisting. That will depend on our political leadership, bills, governors, then at the state level can resist the federal. But ultimately at the local level, it's going to come down to where do you live? Who are your trusted networks? Have you done the work in advance of the emergency to build trust? If you have, it'll be in place and you'll be resilient. If you haven't, you'll likely move to self-preserving and only thinking about yourself. And I don't think that's a gospel witness. Yeah. I think a gospel witness is you're prepared so you can be steadfast. And when you're steadfast, when you can endure patiently, as the scriptures teach us, then you can actually help other people in a time of need. You can be strong. They're going to listen to you. You're going to be able to lead. You're going to be able to help people who have never thought about any of this. And so my hope is that each of us will take up that responsibility and steward it well. That's really good. It, and that's the, the, the voting aspect. We often think of the presidential election. We forget about the other elections. We, obviously, we've got Congress, but we've got state legislator races. We've got statewide races in the states. And, and, and Gabe is absolutely right. The sheriff is actually one of the strongest in any county or in my state, parish. The, they have the influence. So we need to be involved in voting, but we also need to be running for those positions. You know, as this all unfolds, Jesus was having, we just got a couple minutes left, but Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples in, in the book of John. And he said, I've told you all of these things. And he had gone through everything that was going to be unfolding, the natural disasters, the wars, the rumors of wars. And he said, I've told you this so that you might have joy in me and your joy might be full. So, so Gabe, we don't have joy by withdrawing and operating in fear. Very quickly, each of you just want to address this. How do we, where do we find that peace, that joy that Jesus promised we would have if we, when we come into these times? I mean, he specifically says, do not be afraid. And I think if you're just listening to independent media sometimes or social media and you're scrolling, it can lead to a sense of fear. We are supposed to be grounded in this hope that shows us that God's love, his grace, his strength will be with us in the midst of whatever comes upon us. And I think we trust that. We just have to daily trust that. But he also wants us to be wise. Yeah. He wants us to build. He wants us to be resilient. He wants us to be able to rely on the people that are around us. And so I think there's good work that we can do, but keep that posture in place all the time. Yeah, Tony, I think, you know, for me, this is, comes to gazing upon the Lord um, to make sure I'm drawing from him because the news will not give me, it will not fill me, it will drain me. So we need the joy that comes from the Lord himself, the hope that comes from the Holy Spirit. And so that comes from communing with the Lord, saying, Lord, I just need to be with you. Just pause. The mind is going to say, oh, no, no, I got to do a hundred things. We need to be with the Lord to deal with these things. We're dealing, not, not only from a hope perspective, because if we don't have hope, we can't give it, but just, you know, the, the direction, the clarity to protection from deception of the enemy, confusion, being frazzled and throwing up our hands to preserve a witness for the Lord. For me, it's, I just am constantly challenged to just draw aside with the Lord himself. And that's his mercy because he wants that and it's good for us. And even if the circumstances are driving us to it. Well, that sounds like what he said, when you abide in me, that is our, our strength, our fruitfulness. And, and that was probably the last thing we feel that we have time to do is to be in the Word of God and step back in prayer because we've got the anxiety of the moment. But the antidote to the anxiety is the abiding Amen. In and, and remember that his name is Sar Shalom, peace. That's one of the names of God. We can trust that his name describes his character and describes his attribute. Just this last week, 
He's also a very practical God. He's a very loving God. Just this last week, we saw one of the greatest miracles in our lifetime, how God shielded Israel from this historic level of ballistic missiles that came in, 190 missiles. Not one Israeli was killed, an absolute miracle compacted in a small amount of time. If he does that for Israel, he loves his own. He will protect us. Remember, he's right. a practical right. God. It right. isn't just theory. He will, pre- he will protect us in practice. Sar Shalom. Amen. Well, to close our time out, Gabe, I want to ask you, would you pray for us and pray over this issue? Pray the, the, the peace uh, for God's people and the wisdom to move according to the spirit, according to the timing of the Lord. Father, we just thank you um, that you are such a good God, that you love us, that you see the future, that you know the future, that we even can read about the future, and that we're told throughout to have joy, to never be afraid, to never be anxious or fearful, God, but to endure patiently. God, for us to remain committed to you, to abiding in you. I love the picture of us all abiding and getting our wisdom from you, getting our discernment, getting our marching orders from you, not becoming self-sufficient or feeling pressure that we have to go figure everything out. God, you have it all sorted out. You're just asking us to live in such a way that we're faithful right where you've called us with the people you've called us to. So God, give us that wisdom as we move from here. Help us to be those who can lead others around us who haven't thought about some of these issues and topics, and yet they're longing for meaning and purpose. They're longing to see hope in the future that I believe you want for all of us, and that's going to happen through your church. So God, just as we walk out of here after this weekend, just help us to go back into our communities, into our counties, and continue to lead with boldness and courage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you.